Joe, we're two weeks late for turning in that provocation thing. I mean, I spent something like 15 hours when I was supposed to be on vacation trying to get something to work out. And I totally failed. And now you've spent like 40 hours trying to figure something out. We've probably thrown away eight different versions of it. This task has a sight out. Yeah, I know. It took me a really long time to come up with the animations I thought we would both like. Ugh. I mean, I'm perfectly fine with being a weird computer thing. But I guess the question is, what are you trying to do with this cartoon version anyway? I've been thinking a lot about this as it relates to the idea of making our work non-representational rather than representational. Like, like not just non-representational research, but also in terms of like, how we present in anything through stories, research, whatever we were talking about. So I've, I've read an enormous amount of really interesting stuff about how people have tackled this kind of an issue. Well, I don't know, how people have dealt with this. And so I was thinking something so cute and adorable, and you would say, oh, but we're just not that cute. And I would change it to, into someone that doesn't look so cute, and then using that as a way to sort of bring out, you know, the in inevitable problems of imagining that you're doing something that's called non-representational or non-narrative, non-whatever the hell we want to call this, you know, like non-linguistic ways of thinking about research. I was thinking like it's more obvious when you're drawn or or when you're shown an image that is something what something is or something what something's not, it, it's being represented. Uh, but you fall into traps of representation all the time. But it's not about the productiveness of forcing yourself or I guess it is about the productiveness of forcing yourself to consider the potential of the non-representational or the potential of things that are beyond knowable. But I think the reason we keep getting ourselves in trouble is because we're using non-representational in two different ways. One is the way, like the Deleuze Guattarian idea about making sure that we're not making any claims that our research is representing anything like what Kevin Leander and I wrote about moving away from claiming that our research represents understanding, like understanding like standing under or standing apart, representing something that already happened in the past. So instead we argue that we have to th rethink the temporality of research or of its written analysis is always an activity that's being produced in the present we're not simply describing or analyzing something that happened previously, but instead we position ourselves in the midst of activity in the present, as in our own presently emergent assemblage with the text of our observations. So we argue that we should be deliberate about not interpreting the present in relation to the future or past outcomes, but instead limit ourselves to what might be observed as activity unfolds. What we're doing in writing this research is not merely reporting or representing on assemblages that exist outside of us, but actually creating such assemblages. So, I mean, that's one idea of non-representational, that we're not making undue claims about our research or what our research does. All kinds of interesting stuff that people have been doing around this. And it's like, I find that I think it might be worth saying something to the group like, so even if we're trying to represent something, about the more than representational, beyond representational. We need to account for the fact that there is enough stuff that we can account for. We can, some, some, some ways we can, but other ways in some very significant ways, we can't. If you're writing about it or you're drawing about it, no matter what mode of expression, you're inevitably gonna run up against, rub up against the representation. You stop doing something with representation because inevitably, like, like, like what would happen if people decide all of a sudden they would do non-representational research in a way that was more in the spirit of the ideas of non-representational, like, like something more or different than representational writing or art or performance. Well, I don't know if I believe that. I mean, I think that's because you would be, if you took that stance, you would still be imagining that what you're presenting is research and the sense of having authority is representation, um, but if you just think that what you're presenting is really just material in the A-signifying flow, then there's no reason not to write. It's just material. Everything is material in the assemblage. 
So I don't agree that you wouldn't write if you thought that. I think you would think, I'm not proving anything. I'm just presenting more material to feed my thinking and for the world to think about. And it produces. There's no such thing as not producing. We're all producing always. And there's no reason to think words are more or less than any other material in the A signifying flow. The things we write or present in more traditional ways are not more, but they're also not less. In reality, the function of everything still is that it gets it just it gets taken up and used regardless of what we think we're doing. It all still gets um like just taken up as part of of the productive desiring machine. It flows. It gets territorialized and deterritorialized. We can't control what happens to it. And I also think it's, you know, it's interesting and it's useful to try, to try to produce other ways of producing ideas. So doing things that are unexpected, like these cartoons, or like when we read about how Deleuze writes about Francis Bacon's work, that brings something unexpected. I think that's also useful, but I think it's a waste of time to be trying to make claims about now we've mastered non-representational work. That's just re-territorializing it. It has to be about the production of something that's surprising or deterritorializing in the context of what are the whatever the assemblage is. People can take the most non-representational work and turn it into representationalism. I mean, there's nothing to do about that. It's just a matter of what emergent enabling conditions the things we're doing in the present produce amongst ourselves. I agree and I disagree. I get what you're saying about how there's no reason to think words are more or less than any other material in a signifying flow. The stuff we write or present in more traditional ways are not more, but they're also not less. It reminds me of the, of the lessons we learned from Rolling Barthes' uh, Death of the Author, you know, that we as authors or artists, performers, do not have control over what the audience does with what we think we produce, writing, art, dance, whatever. Uh, but I, I disagree too, because you know I feel like we have an ethical responsibility to re-present, research in ways uh, that push back against the traditional born research, that disconnects us, that disaffects us. To me, it feels unethical to do research. And we benefit from this because we have professor jobs. But we, we also get promoted and so on because of our research. But who, who did this benefit? Uh, what good does this actually do? If no one reads your research, it is like the riddle of a, of a tree falls in a forest and no one hears it or sees it, did the tree really fall? In the context of our work with kids with disabilities or deaf kids, there are real consequences for our work not being read or seen or taken up by people. I get that we have no control over how it is taken up. I get that. But I also feel like we have an ethical responsibility to represent research for academic and generalist audiences to affect them, to affect them, to inspire them, to inform them, to piss them off about the things that are happening to those less privileged than us. To me, it's the ethics of aesthetics. If we were, if we re, if we write or represent in sterile ways, we cannot be surprised by the fact that folks take up our work in sterile ways or don't even pay attention to us at all. But on the other hand, on the other hand, I guess I like what you're saying about not making a claim because it's like when we were writing about that kid, uh, the nonverbal child in that preschool in Paris, and how we we argued that we cannot make claims about what his actions meant. Uh, we could, we talked about the productiveness for us uh, to think about his difference and the way it affected us, and the productiveness of the fact that we didn't we we didn't know we didn't know what he really thought or what it meant to him. And this is where you're where you're going to you're going to say something about the the both and aren't you, Gil? Psychotherapist with kids has moved me into this other version of non-representation, um, the second idea of non-representation, the way that most of what happens has these effects, but that those effects never come into conscious awareness, which is like ninety percent of the time I'm in therapy with kids. Not only do I have no idea what's going on, but also nothing is going on that is about symbolic meaning or about conscious content a lot of the time. Like we're chanting nonsense words or we're dancing around. It's not symbolic representation, so what is it? What does this non-representational relating do? 
I know something's happening. I know it matters. I just don't know what it is. Well, well, you know it matters and that it might also not matter, right? Or, or, or that it might not matter at that moment you are in the session or even after it. It might not matter until like 40 years later, right? Well, so yes, I mean, if you want to parse it out into the individual things that happen in any one therapy session, a lot of it doesn't matter, but that's, but that's still not the point. It's because we spend time together, like full of stuff that matters and doesn't matter. I, I think the banality, I think that's just as important. Uh, it's the quality of the time together overall, regardless of whether we're doing significant things or not. Oh. So if you're doing this kind of work, you, you can't make claims, right? Well, you have to hold your claims very lightly, that's for sure. I mean, it's not possible for us not to make claims. I make claims all the time because I have to have a method for working. So I have to have some way of thinking about the fact that I do this or I don't do that. So I make claims, but I have to hold those claims really lightly. All right. We don't want to hold steadfast to them. We're not rigid about it, or at least... We are transparent about the fact that we are making claims, right? They're working hypotheses. It's a process, the actual, you know, that you're recognizing that it's always already becoming, right? The minute you make claims with certainty about it, then you're no longer attending to the possibilities that pretend, or, or the potential of it becoming something other than what you expected. It's like that um, paper I gave about Wilfred Beam, who writes about going into therapy sessions with your patients without memory or desire. You have to enter the session without memory and desire, but part of that is it's impossible to enter sessions without memory or desire. So you hold the impossibility. You, you hold the impossibility, you're saying, even though it's impossible to still try, right? Or to see what gets produced and the difference between what's impossible and what you do, you hold on to the productiveness of the difference. And that's also the incredible productivity of the non-representation or the, or the asignifying. I think it helps me to think about the productiveness of the impossibility itself, as you say. I also think that we, as researchers and writers and artists and performers, that we need to be more transparent about how we represent the productiveness of the impossibility itself. So where did this leave us? Well, what do we gain? or lose by making claims lightly in terms of the political project of doing the work we do to bring to light folks on the margins. You know, what sort of vulnerabilities does a researcher, a writer, or artist, or performer take on in doing this in our current context? Or how do we make use of things we cannot grab hold of or say? What I know is that we both believe very strongly in the productiveness of difference, but there isn't much else you can say in advance about the emergent specificity of difference, is there?